Welcome to Season 4, Episode 4 of the Relentless Pursuit Podcast, an interview with Brett and Christine Bowman from Bees Gourmet Nuts. Yeah, we're really excited to share this conversation with you. Today's guests are Brett and Christine Bowman, a married couple and parents to three children who opened their own gourmet nut business after experiencing multiple health-related challenges. In 2016, Christine had open heart surgery to address a rare heart defect, and almost exactly a year later, Brett was diagnosed with throat cancer. After Brett was diagnosed with cancer for a second time in 2019, Brett and Christine decided to take their hobby for making delicious cashews and turn it into something special, all while still working their full-time careers and raising their three children. Today, Bee's Gourmet Nuts can be found in over 140 stores in 26 states, and a portion of all proceeds goes towards the Cancer Wellness Center, a nonprofit that has supported Brett and the entire Bowman family during their health challenges. So as you'll hear in this conversation, uh, we learned so much from them. Uh, we learned from Brett and Christine about supporting your spouse and how to talk to your children about various challenges, relying on a support network, following your passions, the importance of food as a catalyst for gathering, and working together as a couple to live out more than the script that's narrated to us. Because Bee's Gourmet Nuts blossomed out of a healthy love of sharing drinks, food, and conversation in small, intimate settings... Um, we decided to kind of imitate that in our interview with Brett and Christine. So in our kitchen with a couple bottles of wine, some charcuterie and a sampling of bees, gourmet nuts, we decided to have a really just kind of deep, thorough interview with them. And we found a little bit more than just an interview. We definitely found some friendship, some conversation and some inspiration um, and kind of just bear with us on the audio because you'll also hear our dog who we did not get rid of during the <laughs> interview. We got rid of our kids, but not our dog um, and the air conditioner kicking on. And so and just it general, is is. yeah, just general kitchen setting kind of ambiance as well. Um, so we had a fantastic time and learned so much from them. We hope this experience is the same for you as well. So without further delay, we present Brett and Christine Bowman. Brett, Christine, thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having thanks. us. Really appreciate you having us here. Yeah, welcome to Canapano Kitchen. <laughs> Um, so as we just kind of get into our, our conversation here, we're hoping that you can just uh, give us uh, first like just a little bit of background on yourselves, um, uh, a little bit of just some of your uh, early life together, some of your profession and education, uh, how you met, any, any fun stuff along the way. Um, so we met in 2000. It was uh, February. We always get in a fight about this. February 2nd or February 4th? And that was always... I was <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think it was the second. Um, but uh, so we met February fourth of uh, two thousand. I was actually in Indianapolis, and uh, you were living in Chicago. You come down to visit uh, a friend of yours from and, college. Yeah, from college, and and I was a basketball coach at the time, and we had oh my gosh, um, you know, every week from November to March, Friday and Saturday were excuse me, uh, Friday and Saturday, we are either a game or you're scouting. And I had one day off within like a four month time frame. So my friend and I went to uh, uh, a local establishment uh, to have a few. Bar. <laughs> 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 um, and so, uh, and so we were out having a few drinks and you were... Uh, I was visiting a friend from college and I don't know, one of those we looked across the room and locked eyes and I was in no mood for any of that. I was she like, what do you think I was like, I'm here with my friends, like, leave me alone. <laughs> and I tell you what, it, it, it's crazy. You know, people say I love at first sight, but as soon as I saw her eyes, I was like, I was, it was, it was like this energy just came over me and mm -hmm. that's called the lightning bolt. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the, the lightning bolt Zeus was like <laughs> throwing them and, uh, and so we just started to keep in touch. I got her phone number and she went back to Chicago that weekend. And, you know, real quickly, we, you know, four months later, I quit my job. I didn't, I didn't, I was teaching, like I said, and I didn't have a place to stay. I didn't have anywhere to go. Um, in Chicago, I didn't have a job or a place to stay. So I moved up to uh, uh, Chicago because that's where she was. Wow. Right. Yeah. So it was, but I was very clear, like, you're not moving here for me. Like, this yeah. is like, no question, right? Like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, <laughs> <laughs> I don't, exactly. Right, like, yeah. I, I'm independent, I live by myself, I have a career, like, no, 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 this is, you're not moving here for me. And I said, no, of course not. And, um, <laughs> 100% I am. Right, right, I was like, you did? Uh, 
Um, and uh, I think a, a year, you moved up in September. Yeah, I, I got a job um, working at a computer company. CDW. Yep, yeah. yeah, CDW. And, uh, a year and a half later, we were engaged. Yeah. And, well, we were engaged in July, the following October, we were married. So it's. Six. So yeah, we were married October of yeah. 2002. Yeah. That's it. And then we had yeah. three kids. We lived in the city for... Till 2007. And then... Um, we moved up to the north suburbs. And then had a third baby. Yeah. Molly. Mm-hmm. And Nick and Lily were the ones that moved up with us. Right. But uh, yeah, no, it was... Uh, it's, it's been an interesting... Uh, uh, I couldn't think of anybody else I'd want to spend the oh, last okay. 21 years. But it's been... It, we've, had, uh, we've had some interesting... Yeah. And you transitioned to real estate. Yeah. And then um, I've always been in ad sales, working for um, like Redbook and Bon Appetit, and then moved into digital with Warner Brothers, The Guardian, and now I'm at uh, Marie Claire. So, oh, yeah. And in addition to what you're doing, you've also now started a business. We have. Bees Grow My Nuts. Okay. And how long, how, when, did, when did you launch that exactly? Uh, it was October, we filed the papers um, October, or November 1st of 2019. Okay. So we, the idea, <clears throat> well, go ahead. Um, wait, 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 the yeah. bees, is that, does that stand for Bowman? It does, okay. yeah. Some people say, they think it's Brett, but uh, to, to be more um, so, oh, please do. <laughs> so Bees Nuts is relatively recent, um, starting in 2019, really right before then the pandemic hit, right? Exactly. But it was a little bit of a long time in coming because of um, some of your history in um, gourmet nuts, cooking and, and dabbling for your friends. But what else really kind of launched the start of this? So about, to, actually 2016, we, uh, you know, Christine had some health problems that we'd gone through. She had a, uh, which is crazy. I, I mean, I don't love to say this, but she is a unicorn. And her doctors have said this. Um, she had an aortic valve replacement and an aneurysm. And so your whole life, right, you had mm-hmm. a, a heart murmur mm-hmm. and kind of kept up with it. And, and then you went to the doctor. I don't want to tell your story. Oh, it's um, my city. It- City internist retired, sent me a letter saying, oh, I'm retired, move on. And so I was like, uh, okay, well, I'm in the suburbs, I need to find somebody. And so I asked some friends and went to this woman who was like my age and had kids. So I kind of was like, oh, great, good conversation, good vibe. And, she, and, and right before she put the stethoscope at me, she said, um, I said, oh, by the way, I have a heart murmur. It's no big deal. And she's like, because it, it, it was very loud. And she's like, you're not fine. And she scared the crap out of me and said, you are, walked me to the door and the, the front desk and said, you will get a cardiology appointment next week. And I'm here to schedule it for you. You're, we're squeezing you in. And I was like, she's like, she's like, I can't believe you haven't felt me. It's just put the fear of God in me. I was like, okay, but I've been fine. I've been able to do all these things at the time. So you, you never really like felt any symptoms of anything. I didn't. I mean, when they kept asking me, I was like, I'm a mom of three. Like, am I tired? Sure. I work full time. Uh, yeah, of course you overcompensate because that's what you know. And yeah, you go through it, right? Like, you know, looking back, you're like, oh my God, you were so tired. Yeah. You, know, like you were just, you, especially at the end of the day. Yeah, and if I didn't work, if I like felt tired working out, it was like, oh, it's, I beat myself up because I'm like, I, it's because I didn't do it five times a week and I did it three, right? right? Things like that. That was my fault. So quickly, we got a second opinion at Cleveland Clinic, and basically, they, I mean, they were all like Cleveland Clinic. The guy walked down there, I forget he had a cross. He's Italian. He walks in, and we're like, hi, how are you? And he's like. Yeah, it's bad. And we're like, okay. oh my God. <laughs> yeah. and, and we're like, okay. So, so this then, is out of nowhere. So this is like I a know. simple, like, you're like, let me find a new doctor because I should. Right. I'm just not trying to do the right thing. We're doing the right thing. Right. And then they're like, there's right. something wrong with you. There's something and wrong with you. And you have no, no idea. No idea. And they're like, you need surgery. And that's the Cleveland Clinic. We're like, let's just do a second opinion just to make sure. I mean, they were like, open heart surgery. It's not a small thing. It's not laparoscopic or anything. And. So I had that done, um, you know, and it turned out that instead of having a bicuspid, as they thought, 
it was a unit cusp. So they were like, this is like kind of one in a million that I would ever have this. And so they were, they told me that they were all texting each other. I was like, I hope not during this. <laughs> Get a load of this. So like, How about the sanitary? I watch Grey's Anatomy. You know, that's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I guess one thing yeah. about that unit cusp, it, it is like, you know, when you, when you meet doctors, especially the heart surgeons, I'm like, oh gosh, you know, and let's say, have you heard about this unit cusp? But, you know, I'm like, and I'll explain your, your whole story. And you know, like, everybody's always just simply amazed. Like, it's just so rare. And, you know, how old were you then when you were diagnosed? So it was a year before Brett got diagnosed, so like 42. But I had the heart murmur my whole life and just sort of was okay, fine. And it's amazing right? that you ran a marathon. Right. You know, I mean, Okay, so you really are. You are a unicorn. I didn't know. I have been done once. It's like check. You know, I'm all done with that. So was there was, was there fear like right if we if this continues to go unchecked then this is like a like a ticking time bomb. Oh yeah, they were like, I'm surprised you haven't fainted. You could drop dead at any moment. And it we and we had no idea. It's right. Like, like it was scary. Yeah. And so I had surgery. My parents moved from Arizona to where we live, um, stayed for a month, and just kind of helped with the kids. And um, Which is the nine-year surgery. So the, the 2016, any Cubs fans know what happened in 2016, right? Mm -hmm. They won the World Series. And, and I remember the, the night of her surgery. So I was sitting in the hospital, you know, all day, and... You know, your, your mind just goes all these different places. She comes out of surgery. The Cubs are playing in San Francisco that night, and they were playing out in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I remember, uh, my gosh, it was, you just got to the ICU room, and, and you were like, I just, I just want, it was like that moment where you're, you're, you just, you just want to make sure that they're okay, right? And that was that first moment in probably 14 hours that, all right, I know she's okay and gone. And uh, and so as I was walking out, the Cubs were coming back at that same time. It was like, it was like the eighth or anything. And I'm in the parking lot, right, of, of Northwestern, which we haven't said anything about Northwestern, but oh my gosh, mm -hmm. phenomenal. Uh, and, um, and but, but the, the, the game's going on and they're coming in, you know, AM radio in the city, you can't get a very good reception. And so it's it's coming in and out, and and you know you, you're hearing that Javier Baez is you know got on base, and you know there's another base hit, and and it's like, and it all kind of you know almost at the same time, it all just kind of came together that you know her she's coming out of surgery, the Cubs are kind of coming together, and it's just this weird way that the universe kind of all comes together, and uh, mm -hmm. um, they ended up winning that game and, right. and moving on to the Dodgers and. Yeah. And so that was so the Cubs World Series win and your health and that that time will always be linked together. That's interesting because I remember watching those games. Yeah. Um, and at least for you, it wasn't like yeah, you had surgery. The game is on, just, you know. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. um, he did go to Game Five. Oh my gosh! So, <laughs> and so right, you were fine. Yeah, gotta do it. You gotta do it. Yeah. And we have this uh, this wonderful friend. Uh, his name is Michael Torancic, and he had called up and known how much uh, uh, it's been. Oh, it, it's just so overwhelming. And and the Cubs were down three one. Right, it was Game Five. And he's like, hey. I've got tickets to the game, um, but it's not the actual tickets in the ballpark. It was um, up in, up in the rooftop. He's like, "Would you want to go?" And I'm like, uh, "You know, you know, here, you still weren't even out of bed yet, no. right? Like, she had her heart cracked open, and just I, I can't imagine the pain that you went through. I just I just remember saying, if you get a chance to go, like go, go. like yeah. I mean, you're not." helpful here at all. So. And, and so here it is, the Cubs are down 3-1, most likely they're going to lose the game and, you know, the series is going to be over with, but hey, you saw the Cubs in the World Series and, and I remember for Cleveland, Trevor Bauer was pitching, right? And, and so here we're sitting up in this, uh, the, the rooftops, you're not in the stadium, but you're not watching it on TV and you're just kind of suspended. Like, do you remember DreamWorks, where the guy, you know, that you've got the moon and yeah, the yeah. kids like hanging there and, 
And I kind of felt like I was sitting on the moon for this game. And, and Trevor Bauer is like pitching. I remember like, we affected that game from this little <laughs> <laughs> we, got the, we got the name, you know, Bauer, Bauer, you know. And, and so, but it was just so electric and the Cubs end up winning and then they go to Cleveland. And, and it's just, there's just kind of been this parallel that just followed it a lot. Like, and, and then, yeah, we went to uh, Boston to see the World Series trophy, but that's a whole other story. We won't necessarily get into. That's just how you were whole lives. <laughs> <laughs> but that's an unbelievable story too. But I think that's really interesting that, and, and I want to talk about this a little bit more because I know like the the caretaking aspects um, for one another obviously played a significant role during that time. Um, so, uh, what kind of, kind of walk us through like that process of just what it's like to care for your spouse who's recovering and, and um, what that looks like for you and your family, just that whole dynamic. Um, and then, you know, at, at what point did then your own health concern arise and, and what was that shift like too? Yeah. Well, I tell you, it, when, when, you're, when you're sitting there and you see, you know, the love of your life laying in bed and can't move and, I mean, her, her chest was cracked open, right? And like, it just like it felt like a million, you know she'd say it felt like a million pounds and you see that you see that you see that pain and and you do anything to just take it away and, and take it on and I guess I got my wish <laughs> right. um, but uh, yeah I mean but I gotta say it's there's been so many people you know your family my family everybody just having having family is make such a big difference and everybody was so great they pitch in they do whatever they can to just be supportive we had a really but, great support system because obviously we didn't know with my surgery what was going to happen the following year so something happens we go to the we send our kids to the small catholic school in um in Winneka and it's very tied to one another. So if somebody is down, there is a rosary set, there's meal trains, everyone just steps up. You don't even need to know them. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. And so um, it turned out that our kids happened to be ultra servers. I run like just out of happenstance the day after my surgery. So um, we had a lot of support, but we do have the unique, to go back to your question, of the caretaking, the unique aspect of not only having the experience each of being a patient and a caretaker, but back to back mm -hmm. and not knowing that that would happen. And, you know, I remember asking Brett, like, if you had to do it all over again, would you do the patient or the caretaker? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was, it was easier. Yeah. interesting, right? Yeah. And yeah. I, I, right, and I answer, I said the patient without a doubt. Because I think, oh, I think it, it's really difficult. But to you just like caretaker. tapped into something else that's like so. Which part of, you know, what we, we can get into is, you know, we, we get back to the Cancer Wellness Center and, and, but being the patient, right? Like, you know, I was in this fight for so much and, you know, for, for my life, but then I realized, like, I, I was, you, you can't see anything else. And then mm -hmm. the pain that that, you know, the, not pain, but I'm not sure how you want to yeah. describe it, but I don't know if, if I, you, like, you would initially think, yeah, I want to be, the patient because you want to take it on but then how do you there, there's a whole nother subsection to that that man you know I was like I mean I was I was like you're in the fight for your life right and you don't realize how you can impact and I, I think when you think of caretaking and especially with marriage you think when you take those vows that but for better or for worse and sickness and health. I don't know about you, but I pictured like old people, <laughs> like, right? Yeah. right? Like you're taking care of each other at the end of your life. Mm -hmm. And so never did I imagine that at 42, this would be what we would be doing for one another. And it completely shifted our relationship. Um, it made us look differently at where we spend our time. And we always look for a silver lining anywhere. I would never, I would never go so far as to say cancer was a gift and any of that. Um, but I do think it's definitely given us a priority that maybe some people don't have if, if they haven't had that point of you're sitting with somebody and creating a living will for the next day. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it was a year after your surgery that Brett was diagnosed with cancer. Almost to the day. Yes. Almost like, so like literally one to two days. Like, how did you find out? Like what what happened in that year that from a year ago to the next year, like all of a sudden you're being diagnosed with cancer? Was there something that happened to you that was like a, like a red flag, or was it you went to the internist and he was like, hey, by the way, you have so, so kind of looking back, it was. So, so for people that don't know, I was um, diagnosed with um, uh, throat cancer, uh, which is HPV. Uh, we, we can talk about more here in a bit, but um, so within how I initially came about it, and I didn't realize at the time, but looking back, like in July, like I had a sore throat. And so I went to the doctor and they did a, a culture swab and nothing came back. And they're like, oh, you're, you're negative for, um, for strep throat. I'm like, okay, great. Right. I thought I have strep. Yeah, right. yeah. Just, yeah. Going on. And then, and then, um, and then I was, I'm, I'm maybe yoga a little bit and, you know, you can do back bends and, you know, stretches and, and I'm like, ah, I felt something like something's not right. Right. I'm like, but you kind of push it off. Right. Like it's human nature. Right? And it's saying like, you still feel like mostly functional, like you, oh, yeah. you just, yeah, go about your daily responsibilities, and it's, it wasn't inhibitive at that point. Or sometimes I tell them, like, I think it's because we're getting old. Like, you feel something, right. and you're like, right, I think it's because yeah. we're getting old. Right, right. So that's <laughs> the shift is happening. Oh, my gosh. Remember when I was, like, in, like, we were living in 1460, I was like, oh, my stomach hurts. Oh, you're not saying system is Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> I'm like, no, seriously, this is, like, when we first met the first year, and I'm like, oh, my stomach, right? Like, we must have been drinking or something like that before. <laughs> And like, I had like really bad gas, I guess, but I didn't know it. And so I'm like, oh, I, I was like, I want to say I'm not a hypochondriac, but I'm like, I need to go to the doctor, right? And so I went to the doctor and I'm like, I was so embarrassed. I'm like, oh my gosh. And so that maybe kind of solidifies you a little bit of like, oh no, I'm going to get through this, right? It's, it's, it's not so, exactly. And so, um, and so, and so that was in July. And then, you know, I was doing, back, you know, I was doing like a back, you know, you stretch your neck back and, and that feels something's not right there and and then i went to uh travel overseas for work and i'm like and i'm over there and i'm like something's really not right and when i get back i'm gonna go to the like the the minute clinic or, or urgent whatever care. Or, or, thank you urgent care and <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh i feel so bad for this lady but so i went to the urgent care in evanston and uh and it was like four o'clock. I, I went to work all day and, and I'm like, oh, I'll stop at the urgent clinic on the way home. And so the lady that comes into the room initially to give the swab, I'm like, I, she, she put the stick down my throat and I like spit up and like, I, like and then I didn't throw up on her, but she just was like, I, I, I felt pre, so bad. Pre I felt, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, she like kind of saw it and like, she's like, oh my God, like she was like completely freaked out, right? And I'm like, and like, and like, like kind of gagged and that's why like, something's not good here. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's why I'm like, and that's when they took me to the ENT, you know, I had to schedule an appointment for the ENT. The ENT said, um, yeah, well, they weren't really sure what it was yet, but there was, there was a lump on, on my tonsil. And so he's like, well, you got two things. You can kind of, he, he gave a couple of different options. And, and the option that I chose was like, let's just get this thing out. Right. And so. Which was scheduled to be a tonsillectomy. Yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah, they were just going to, they were going to take the tonsil in. Uh, and I remember it was, was it October 31st? Yeah. Um, it was, it was Halloween. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah. And so it was up in, it was up in the north suburbs of, of Northwestern. And I remember going in that morning. And, and having, remember, you know, we had like meals up to that day and uh, ice cream and mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the whole nonsense of thing. And, uh, I mean, we did every shake. Like, I think we went through right. every shake. Which one do you think was the best shake? I think Meatheads. That's good. <laughs> uh, Meatheads uh, was, was really good. But um, so, so I went under, right? And when you go under, you don't know. Like you lose consciousness. Right. Like How long you've been there? What's going right. on? Yeah. 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 And so I was like, I remember being in the room. They put me under, and then the next thing I know, I wake up, and and I see her. I see Christine, and she's looking at me. She's got these tears in her eyes. Like, I'm like, 
what what's going on, right? Like, and uh, and I'll so, pick it up from there. Please, it, was, uh, it was on me. So they, um, I'm sitting in the waiting room thinking, oh my god, the tons like me. All I've heard is as adults, it's very painful. We have obstacles. He's a man. It's a super complaining. Like, okay, <laughs> it's like the worst, the worst. And it was literally an episode of Grey's Anatomy that I'm like sitting there and I'm watching all these doctors come out and tell their patients, loved ones, everything's fine, he's in recovery. Da, da. The doctor comes out to Brett uh, uh, that was operating on Brett and is like, can, can we get a private room here, please? And I was like, one well, I know this is this, this is not good. And so, you know, by myself, because again, it was just a simple tonsillectomy. And so we go in the room and um, he said that when he went to intubate him, he knocked something loose. He was prepared to do a tracheotomy, so he had like an X right there, but they were able to take it out. Um, and then I kind of forget everything he said except for the word radiation. And um, I was like, oh, okay, okay, that's that's fine. So right then I knew, right, right then, that it was cancer because they were sending it for a biopsy, but the fact that he was already taking the leap of this is what the solution's gonna be, that he had already seen it and known what it was. And um, said that they sent the mass, I guess, away for uh, biopsy and a few days later we found out. But like, what was your reaction at that point? Because you're like, okay, I just had heart surgery a year ago. Like, this has been probably not the year you had anticipated, not what you guys had planned for. This was not in the plan, right? Right. You fall in love, you get married, you have right. kids, you buy the house, whatever, your friends, career. Yeah. Yes, it's all there. Right. Then something happens to you. Like, are you, like, just completely, like... Well, well, actually, are you I'm processing I'm, it. I want to expand like, that a little what, bit. What is going on right yeah. now? What What is it like? Because we've, I've imagined this, and, and you know, briefly, we have not experienced this. But what is it like to find out, like to hear the words "you have cancer" or "you need heart surgery," and what is it like to hear the words "your spouse has cancer" or yeah. "your spouse needs cancer"? And I think it's, I think that to your point, it's different, right? So you feel like you you have to have heart surgery is different than your husband has cancer. Because for me, I, I, I felt like he's got cancer, go on. Okay, right. let's go. For him, for me, I was like, and I think this is what we learned from my health crisis was that we have we both have to be there because I completely shut down. I didn't want to know, really know the process. I didn't want to know what they were doing. I wasn't interested in, in the way the heart works. And I, 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 was, I had asked, are you cracking open my chest? And they said, yes. Yeah, that's kind of all I need to know. Great. And a few questions after that. And he took notes and followed up and did all of that information. And I just was like, I just have to get through this. And then it flips and you hear that. And I'm like, yeah. oh, I, I, I don't want to be the patient because I, I want to be in control as much as one can. Yeah. You went into survival mode. Yeah. I was there to help oversee yeah. it. And then the flip side, I went into survival mode and mm -hmm. you were there. And it feels good because you're out of it. Everything's out of your control. And we so desperately want to control everything in our lives that we, and you can't. That um, I feel like when you're like when you're in that go mode of survival mode that you can help somebody, it feels empowering and like you feel like you're making a difference rather than just sitting there hearing the news. Right. So you obviously had a good support system. You were obviously on the same team and so when you were out he was, you were still in it, but he was, you know, in overdrive and right. vice versa. You had your parents coming to stay. You've got the support of, like, your local, your kid's school, which is great. Um, but, like... Which we can't, I don't want to, I don't want to over... It was amazing how this community really come together. Um, and just, whether it's the, taking a, you know, taking a kid to a uh, hockey practice or, you know, picking a kid up from school. Just the community and, like... And that's kind of part of also, I think, you know, as we tap into this, the, the nuts, and, you know, we'll get into that more, but just bringing everybody together, right? Like, you need that community to to help survive. And like, I was supposed to get out of the hospital, and our kid was having his birthday, and I was like, oh, for sure, be home by then. And they were like, we found something. When I was in the hospital, I was like, we can't let you go. You have to, you have to stay another night. And I was like... I was so mad, I was in tears. I was like, my goal was to be home by his birthday. And um, my friends, our friends, they, they played football and uh, brought a cake to the football game and gave them this huge celebration. And it's like, just seeing that brought tears to my, our eyes because it's like, you don't, nobody has to do that, right? And 
and thinking that he's probably going to go home and have nothing because Brett was down visiting me, and that wasn't possible. It didn't really do much more than that. So So how how did you guys stay positive through that? I mean, that's one year and then another year back to back. Like, how did you stay positive through it? I mean, knowing that you've obviously got three kids who need you, and you can't be there in the way that you're used to being. Right. And how did you guys like stay connected to each other? Because obviously, like when someone is ill and not feeling well, like like how do you how does the marriage thrive during that time, or does it not? And you have to be okay with that. Like, what does that thrive is a struggle? Well, yeah, it it definitely doesn't thrive. I mean, in all honesty, it's survival. It is survival, and you're just trying to cover off on everybody you need to, and you know. And and I'm gonna say like, you know, the one thing I think. You know, for us is we've always had that similar goal, right? Like we've always been aligned in in the goal of what we want to achieve, and 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 you you go outside of just yourself, and it's that greater good, the team, whatever, and and we know we're going to achieve that, right? And so so we just we put our eyes on what we wanted. Yeah, but it wasn't so much like okay, let's sit down and plot. It's like we've always been lock and step on how we want to raise kids and what we want from our lives and all of that. That's like when one of us is out, the other one steps up without even really a thought or like a, a, plan. a plan. Right. It's just like this, we know we're going to carry it through. And it was really important to us. Our kids were like kind of old enough to know. And again, our community is very small. So the last thing we wanted to happen is our kids find out through somebody else. So we sat them down one night and told them each time and you know I think you just sort of put yourself and your marriage on the back burner because you've got the three kids that are like asking questions like why is this happening and is are you gonna die and you've got to be really prepared for that um, we went to see a therapist to uh, ask how to answer these questions or what's the best way to talk to the kids about it, how soon do we tell them, so that we felt like we were doing right by them, um, and not just doing what we thought was best. Because then it's about us, right? It's, oh, it's yeah. about them and, and preserving them so they don't remember. Like <laughs> <laughs> You want them to think of like fourth grade, and yeah, think yeah, yeah. like life's great in fourth grade, not like, is my mom gonna die? Yeah. Or my dad gonna die? What is, and so and so had cancer and they died, so. Yeah. That, and how does that, that affect them as they go? Right, but, right. So it was really like we put ourselves on the back burner and it was about the kids, but I think because we built such a strong relationship and been locked step, that, that was okay. You know? But it always hasn't been locked. I mean, we've always, we've sometimes had our challenges of making a lock step. So yeah, yeah. we don't want to sure. say like, hell my God, we got this perfect relationship. Like, we're know. all there, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <we're Okay>. <laughs> Let's keep talking. <laughs> I was like, I don't even lighten it up because, like, oh yeah. my gosh, yeah. wow. It's tough, yeah. Yeah, it's it's heavy. This is bringing back memories for me because when I was young, um, like fourth and fifth grade, my mom had cancer, and she survived. Um, But what kind of cancer she had? She had breast cancer. Mm -hmm. But um, my parents did not tell us for a long time. No, we we could notice certain things like, hey, there's a lot of people bringing us food lately, Um, or you know, my mom's gonna be in the hospital. You know, she hasn't been feeling that great, and I remember visiting my mom in the hospital and. At that time, like we were, I was young enough where it's like, oh, my, my parents you know, are making a big deal, but I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. Um, and I would have like the, um, I don't know what she was called, like the, the social emotional you know worker at our elementary school check in on me. She's like, hey, how's your mom doing? How are you doing? And I'm like, everything's fine. I got to be alone. <laughs> um, but then, you know, after my mom had had surgery and was. You know, somewhat in the clear, then my parents said, like, just so you know, this is actually what happened. I remember that thing too. Me and I had two sisters, and uh, we all like, went to our bedrooms and just cried, like, mm-hmm. you know, she could have died. Um, and you know, it was kind of a journey after that. And she actually has cancer now. It came back, it actually came back about 10 years ago. Um, and she's been on like different treatments and, and things since then. Um, but so that's kind of played, it. I'm just like, kind of reimagining that. Mm-hmm. And I, I wondered. Ever since that, like as an adult, like what would I tell my kids? How would I help them navigate this? Because in a way, I felt like my parents not telling me was protective. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I Which is a natural instinct of a parent, right? Right. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, I feel like I should have known that. 
I was old enough to understand, you know, in fifth grade, you, you, you get it for you know, as much as a fifth grader can. Um, so I, I kind of walk us through, like, and, and I know listeners will have just their own share of challenges, whatever it may be, even if they're not identical. Um, but what does a decision of how to talk to your kids, like, uh, how did that conversation go between you and how did, how did you approach that uh, with, with your children? I was going to say before, and I'll let you answer this question, but, but I guess the one thing I do want to say is I think the most important thing is to do what's natural for, for you as an individual, right? And like what, like what might be the, the path that we chose isn't necessarily the path for you guys or the path for somebody else, right? And so, so you've got to, you know, as, as your parents did, like, there's no judgment towards them, right? Like maybe as a kid, right? Because that's what we got to complain about later on down the road. Exactly. <laughs> But, um, but but that was what was natural to them at that time, and you can't necessarily fault them for that. So um, so it's really just, I think, what our experience was and how we raise, you know, how we're trying to raise our kids, which doesn't make it any better or worse than what anybody else is doing. Um, but with that, I do think there is a generational thing. We had somebody at our Sacred Heart community um, have a cancer, and they, some, the kid wound up finding, this is terrible, the kid wound up finding, the child wound up finding out at, he was at a play date at somebody's house and overheard two moms talking about it. Mm. And that's how, and he went home and said, is something wrong? And that developed. And the kids are like, always listening. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think as I talk about how amazing our community is, it is also small. And so it's like, if you're going to say, hey, I just want to let you know that we may need some rides and this is why, you know that it's not like, it doesn't turn into gossip, it just happens to travel, whether it's a rosary being said or anything. And we have always thought that we need to establish trust with our kids and that so it has to come from us. And so we were very clear with them. Like I mentioned, we went to see um, a therapist about really how to talk to them and their different ages and what to really answer. And you just answer the questions that they ask. You're not telling any more than they know, than they want to know and um, I think that's so important that a lot of times we're like afraid to ask for help or to turn to a professional like right. oh now we have uh, like a health another health issue like to admit that you need help in even a different way like in how to talk to your kids because you feel like you probably should know how to do that but you've never done this before right. Right? most people don't ever have to do that so I think that's so important for anybody who's listening to be like when you don't have the answers to go in search of the answers yeah and I think you know, like you said you know talking about your parents and you know, there's different times, and and it's understanding how you know there's there's progressions throughout time, and and you know, 40 years ago, it's, you know, it's not good to look, you know, to go towards a shrink, you know, yeah. if you will, right? right? And so, but that stigma, yeah, the, the stigma, and and so, you know, you just all you want to do is just help yourself, you know, help help your kids and help everybody. And, and they were at so, such such. Gentle stages. But so this you, for context, how, how old were they in 2016? Um, so five years ago. It was fifth grade, fourth grade, and like first, first grade. grade. Okay. And um, you know, it was, and I, yeah, we just felt like let's get some help with this. Really talk about how to have the conversation, and then just say anything you hear is wrong unless it comes from us. And so if you hear if somebody says, oh, you know, my aunt had cancer and she died, that's not. That, that may be that person's, but that's not, we will always answer anything to you. And I just think having kids, the most important thing is to establish that trust and exact trust. And, and that open that's line of communication that you can come ask us anything. And I remember the, the therapist saying, they are going to ask you if you're going to die. And I remember like crying because that's, it's the biggest thing in fear. And yet you can't, you don't want to show that emotion going back to what you're saying about your parents. Like you don't want to admit that you feel that bad because they kind of look to you for how to respond. And so I got that out and of course she was right. They asked the question and you answer it. And I'm not sure where we want to go with the with your conversation, but but there I think there's a question of showing vulnerability, right? Like that there's as a parent, right, you would want to be the superhero. And then there comes that line of this, you know, how vulnerable do you want to show your kids how comfortable and and I think that's a really intriguing thought. We don't necessarily have to go deep yeah. into it, but... Um, yeah, is it okay to be upset? Is it okay to cry? Is right. it okay to yeah. be scared? And, and 
I'm sure you said that yes. Feel that. And it feel is that. because if they don't, it comes somewhere. It comes out somewhere else, right? And we've always said like that's where we establish like the family vault. Like what's what what we say here stays here. So it's always a safe. If you want to come home and cry, that's okay. Um, if you want to get mad, that's okay. And you want to ask a question that you are afraid to ask, that's okay too. Right, because home is yeah. Yeah, it's where safe. You do those things. Yeah. yeah. So in all of this, obviously health issues for you, health issues for Brett. You obviously you guys obviously navigate that with your kids. You go through treatment, you go through like rehabilitation of all of that. Where does these nuts come into play? Wait, 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 wait. I just want to ask a quick question okay. before that's okay. Um, how are you guys doing today? I'm fine. I just do annual um, cardiology appointments, but my heart will eventually, um, I'll have to have the valve replaced in, I don't know, 10, 12 years, um, but it will be through, like they won't have to go they like to go through my coin. By that, they'll go through Instagram. Right. 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 From when she was like one year old, and she she had this uh, cow uh, stuffed cow, whatever. And so the valve that she got, and I just had this conversation last week with your dad, yeah. um, and uh, I was like, "Well, no, did she have a pig valve or a cow valve?" And I'm like, "It was absolutely a cow valve because it's Molly, and Molly was jealous because she got <laughs> a cow yeah. valve." Yeah. 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 So, uh, so we'll never <laughs> ever forget the grateful cow yeah. that. Yeah, I prefer yeah. both. Right. <laughs> right. We're elevating the cow. Right. Right. So, um, uh, but so yeah, how we got? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So how we how we got to these nuts? Uh, to, 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 well, yeah, to so your fault. Oh. I thought it was like. You know, I had this little cough. Yeah. You know? Now, um, actually, thank you for asking. Um, you know, we have I have scans every four months. Uh, the last scan was great, um, but there it becomes this anxiety that. Wow, and, and you know, so so you kind of learn to live within like four month increments, um, and you kind of learn that the hard way. And how we got the bees nuts, bees gourmet nuts. I always hate when people say bees nuts. I don't know why. But uh, so 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 I had cancer in my throat um, in 2017. Um, I went in for a couple scans, and then it went. Uh, and in 2019, we had a, I had a scan that showed that it went from my throat down to my lung. And um, like, oh my God, here we go again. And, and so, no one, I've had that kind of pre-experience of like, wow, hey, you're gonna go to scans, it's gonna be okay, or, you know, people want to tell you, it's all right, it's all right. You don't necessarily know that, but you just, you've gotta live within those four month time frames that, that you have. And so, so how we got to Bees Gourmet Nuts was um, uh, I, in 2019, I, I got diagnosed with, with uh, the cancer in my, in my lung, and they said, all right, and, and so as soon as you hear cancer, and again, it flashes you back to the first time, and, and I'm like, oh my God, I can't do this again. And I'm so sorry for. I don't want to bring this like to negative. Like I always want to be upbeat, and, and so, but, but to kind of share the story, I'm like, oh my god, I can't do this again. And because the first time, I had two surgeries, thirty-five radiations, and I think it was eight chemo's all the time. And well, like, one surgery was in the middle of the night. Coughing up blood. I mean, it wasn't like it wasn't like that at all. It was like he woke me up. He's like, I think I'm dying. Like, there was blood all over the house. And so when I when I had come the second time, I'm like, Oh my god, how am I going to get through this? Right? Like, I can't go through this again. Especially all the all the exertion that I kind of took in that initial round. Yeah. To yeah. think that now, like, are we not, back there? And exactly. Like, not just for me, but for my family. Right? Like, and I know. There's, you know, we kind of get to this a bit about the cancer wellness, but 
when people that are affected by cancer, it's not just the cancer patient, it's it's the caregivers as well. And and man, and so I was like, I knew I needed to have this kind of light to get me through this dark tunnel. And so I'm like, wow. And and so it was like going back to these cashews that, that we were making at home, and I'm like, and I had I had this great friend, there's a great story behind it of how he got introduced, you know, like, hey, I would just tell real quick, um, you know, uh, our daughter plays uh, hockey competitively, and we go on these tournaments, and, and I had a, a good friend, dad, on the team, was like, let's put a Bloody Mary bar together, right? And so we were up in Toronto, and, and you always need that dad on the team. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I got an idea. Yeah. <laughs> And, and uh, this was like after a year and a half of playing. Yeah, this was in January. So just like, hey, yeah. we're doing this, yeah. um, this competition. And, and, so, and so we put this Bloody Mary bar together, made bacon, had M&Ms, just, it was all out, like the Bloody Mary bars and Bloody Mary bars. Mm -hmm. and, and so I made, I was like, I'll make these cashews, right? And so we brought them up and all the parents were like, oh my God, these are good, these are, these are great. And I'm like, thank you. And one of the dads comes up to me, and was like, hey, you know what I do? I don't know, you know, you're, you're a heavy stat, right? <laughs> I don't care, you're a good dude, right? Yeah. And he's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm in the food business, and he's like, we should talk. And I'm like, yeah, okay, you know, wouldn't that be funny, like, start a, start a company? And like, <laughs> but, um, and so that was like in January of, of 19, and, and then, you know, later in the year, I, uh, you know, I got, I got diagnosed a second time. And I'm like, oh my gosh, hey, you know, I can't go through this. I need to, and I kind of put two and two together. Not necessarily two and two together, but I was like, wow, this is. I, I need to have something to focus on to get me through. I need something to, to, you know, a goal. That's possible. Cool. Yeah, yeah. And it's like all I wanted to do is try and get this these cashews that I've been making for ten years on the shelf, right, of one store, right. Well, that's it. Like. You know, with not being in the food business at all, like there was something that was just there was a barrier there, right? And it's like I want to cross that barrier of of getting these nuts are making it home. You're gonna make it from from a, a personal hobby to yeah, may, maybe not to business at that point, but at least something that's that's commercial, so that other people exactly. And then like start thinking about it, and like and we, we start talking, and we're like oh, what should we name it? And like and then it became this like this positive energy that, that came through. And Especially instead of talking about, I mean, once he got diagnosed the second time, there was a, a big like six week window where it was like the diagnosis to when he would have the surgery. And you don't know anything in between that. Yeah. Is it like after the surgery, he's gonna go have radiation and, and chemo again? Or is it, do they get it all? And so, with, so that you're sitting there and neither of you wanna discuss what if, because you've kind of already been down that road and it's incredibly scary the second time. And so for the, for that point, we just were like, what does the branding look like? What would we call it? We just started coming up and it But was it's like, like a, a new joint mission. It's not the yes. mission of like getting somebody else through this again. Right. Like you're yeah. like, we've done that. Like, right. what else do you got? Like right. something positive. Right. Yeah. And yeah. it was like happy, right? And, yeah. and that was when Brett kept saying like, I just want to bring joy to people and everybody who, you don't know how long you're gonna have, right? right? And, like, and I remember, I remember when we were talking about the name, what we call the company, and 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 the the cashews leads, which are now the insatiable. We were like, we were stuck on it, right? Like, we had all these worries going on, and we would write names down, and and I remember like, we're looking at we, the thesaurus, what yeah. does this mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. You are all in. Yeah, 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 Our yeah, yeah. English majors exactly. came out in like crazy ways, where it's like, okay, what is, what do you think? And yeah. And then you came up one day like insatiable. Well, I was of course eating them off. They just come out of the oven. And I was like, these are insatiable. And we both just looked at each other and we're like, that's it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so hopefully, you know, it gives that like intriguing like, ins what is insatiable? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they are, by the way. And I, I'm actually eating the decadence. The, but the, the bowl is empty. The bowl is empty yeah. currently. <laughs> well, we got a couple more minutes. <laughs> you know. um, but. Uh, um, and so, so I just want to give it, I remember the Grand and, and Winneka was the first store. Marlene was the lady. And I remember while, while we were working on the naming and, and I'd take the kids up to get milk and I'm like, Marlene, I've got some nuts, i got some cashews. There's, a There's your nuts, there you go. Right? Uh, 
It's like, they're going to get it, right? And so just kind of, you know, and so she was the first store that we were in. And, and then it became this, oh my gosh, do you remember? So, so we were working on this, and my surgery was October wow. 23rd. Mm -hmm. My birthday is October 22nd. Right? And, and I go, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. You go into surgery, and I'm going to go around to like six or seven stores and kind of sell this prototype, right? I don't know what I'm doing. I don't have a pitch. I don't have anything. But I just wanted to to get out and talk to people. And so, so are you? Are you just walking in with a with a, a bag and asking to speak to the manager? Right? Yeah. Okay. Exactly. I don't oh, about the cheese section. So we're very specific. Right? Yeah. So not the manager of the store, yeah. but because we knew that exactly where it would sit. This was in all our discussions. That it wasn't a planter's nuts that it was going right. to sit on a counter in or in the, in the in the nut aisle. It was really for the cheese monger to really say, oh, this enhances this cheese, or this would be a good board, or make the board yourself and add them. And so we started looking up who to contact. Yeah. And um, and so, and then it became this, like, and I remember, so that was like the 22nd, I had my surgery on the 23rd, and and I thought I was gonna be in for a couple of days, they told me I'd be in for a couple of days. I got out of surgery, and they were like, oh, if you can do, they had this like tube where you, you know they had the, uh, the ball and he's like, and like if you can get that you can get out right and so i remember sitting there for like those four hours like oh my gosh like like it was it was crazy like they took a portion of my lung out right like <laughs> but you would go home yeah right <laughs> and and so i remember so i was able to get out that same day and so like you know i was thinking going back to my previous stint with it and now I was like, wait, I can get out the same day. And then the next day, I was like, I was so determined. And like, you drove me around. You know, it was such a momentum, you know, to like, hey, I want to get through this. I want to get through this. And it just kind of had that goal. And, you know, try to relate it back to everybody. And, you know, just having something that, I'm not sure the right way to phrase it, but... Well, it was a goal and it was positive. The kids, when we went back in for the second time, we had to tell them that the cancer came back. We said, is there anything that you would want this time? And assuming that he'd be there two or three days, I remember the kids saying, we really want to see him in the hospital. Because he wasn't in a, he had a feeding tube. I mean, it wasn't what we expected after the first surgery. And it was upsetting. Um, and uh, and uh, so we're like, okay, so I was Hey, we're gonna go down. So I got the kids in the car, and I was like, let's grab dinner at Portillo's, and we'll go visit Dad, and we'll do the drive through on Clark Street. And um, he calls us, we're on our way down, and he's like, actually, I can go. So I was like, okay, actually, we're gonna take a detour. <laughs> we're gonna go pick up Dad, <laughs> and then we're gonna go to Portillo's. Yeah. yeah, I went to bed, got the cake, the whole thing, and it was like a really, it was a really great memory because it was a surprise, an unexpected surprise, and. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, think I literally had surgery the day before. I was like, like so determined to, to just get out. And, I, and the, the thing that was motivating is like we had this little board, uh, like a little chalkboard, and we got the kids involved to it, the two. It was like, all I want to do is get into 10 stores, right? Like, and there, there was a countdown, and like, and like everybody became involved in it. And so yeah. where, to, I'm very interested in this. So like, what was on the chalkboard? Where was this in your house? Like, so of course it's a kid's chalkboard. It's not like one we bought from. It was on the glamorous. Right. Yeah. 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 The kids like, like play school. Right, right. we were sure. like, let's whiteboard this or anything, yeah. right? <laughs> it was exactly a school thing. And um, so it was down in the basement, we brought it up, and it, was, it looked like a sandwich board, and we wrote 10 stores. And so the kids would come home from school and they, you know, they would be like, all right, time to update the board. They'd be like, what? We're like, nine stores. They'd be like, oh my gosh, you have one. So I was like, <laughs> cross out 10 and right, nine. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. This many accident-free yeah. days. Yeah. yeah. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just, it was fun. And, and, and then it kind of goes back to, you, you, you brought something up earlier. When I, when I had my first surgery, right? Like, they told me, you know, so the first time I had cancer, they told me, whatever you do, before I, before I, whatever you do, don't get a feeding tube. And I'm like, okay, I'm in. I'll, whatever, I, I, I will not get a feeding tube, right? Like, who, who, who said that? Uh, one of the doctors, uh, um, actually it was a throat specialist, like this person that's, you know, helps you swallow, because like, it, it's, it's, it's not good. And I'm like, okay, I'm in, whatever. And I 
get out of my first surgery. I've got nose tubes and I've got the feeding tube to my nose. And I'm like, I woke up, I'm like, what is that? I didn't even get a chance not to get the, you know, the feeding tube. And, like, and so it's, it, there's kind of those things out. And I was like, but, but then having that feeding tube, right? So you're not eating food through your mouth. Like you're putting it, and I had it for probably four weeks. And oh my gosh, you talk about, you, you know, we're sitting around, you know, a charcuterie, a beautiful charcuterie board, by the way. Um, the rose, you got to <laughs> like the TikTok on that slide, right? yeah, yeah. phenomenal. Um, but but it's like here here you are, almost in like a uh, you know those those big uh, you know the um, in the sea, you know the the metal. Uh, yeah. yeah. I'm not sure how to best describe it for the rest of those old fashioned like scuba suits. Yeah, the yeah. scuba suit. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of felt like that when everybody else is eating because I couldn't eat, right? I, I'm, I'm trapped. And I remember we went out, the first time we went out to dinner, I'm like, somebody had some soup and I'm like, I'm like can I at least smell it? Because I couldn't eat it, right? And, like, and you realize how food brings everybody together, right? Like, it's, like we really live our lives, I think, from one meal to the next. And you take that away and it's like, wow, like, I want, it's like, you really do, I think, um, you know, it's, it's amazing how food brings people together. Like, the, and I'm not, again, you asked us earlier, are we foodists? No, we're not. Uh, but, it, but the food, you know, it's amazing. Like, you know, um, I kind of lost my thought, I apologize. But, um, but that's what I think is the other unique thing about the cashews and, and the charcuterie board and bringing it together and, you know, being at that moment where you you can't, you know, you're, you're, you're apart from everybody else's, like, especially like when you go on vacation, right? Like, like hey, we're going to have lunch, we're going to have dinner, right? You have those, and like, you know, for a short period of time, you're not a part of that. And, and it's like, really, then what's life? And you know, life without food is, you know, it's, it's good, you know, it's, but the food just really. It's an experience. Brings, yeah, yeah. yeah it, I it's mean, exactly. Thanksgiving. If you think about this, because, oh my God. because we had three kids, it was like, what are we going to do for Thanksgiving? And we cooked Thanksgiving, and you know, he cooked. Have you done the emergency room? Because I cut myself. Oh. So I was cutting the turkey for the first time and sliced my finger oh, six inches yeah. later. We so walk into the emergency room, and they see him with his, you know, yeah, and, tube, and they all yeah. go to him. I was like, actually, it's, it's me. <laughs> finger, and they're like, oh, you made it before all the drugs got here. <laughs> Which. Great sense of humor there. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. But you know, um, so I hundred percent agree. And like for for us, I think that manifests the most with our family dinners, where we just about every night, like just as uh, the, the six of us around the table with a meal, like it's it's like this communal experience. Right? You're you're all eating the same food, doing the same thing together. No screens, no other like worries at that time. It's just that that togetherness that the food facilitates for us that it, it's, it's often overlooked um, or taken for granted. And it, it, so it's nice to recognize, like, we could, we could really make something of this. You know, we can really give it its, give it its due attention, its due worth, like that, that act of gathering. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we hit the 10 stores by, by the end of the year, it was like, I think early yeah. December we hit it, we were like, well, we're onto something here. Yeah. Like, I thought it was gonna be really, you know, it was kind of like, oh, let's do our neighborhood store, and she maybe took pity on us, and I don't know, but, but now she's like, she, now we look back, she, she didn't, because she's super incredibly honest, and you're so grateful for that, but, um, And I remember one out, out of the 10 stores, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind, of course, all 10 of them, I can name them to you, um, uh, there, there's actually a couple, three, actually not four, it's like uh, actually all ten, right? Yeah, <laughs> uh, standard market. There was um, standard market out in Westmont. Uh, you know, it's a great, great grocery store. And AJ's uh, the cheese marker there. Um, another one in Hinsdale that was uh, as Jackie, uh, private tender. Uh, it's a meat shop. And then uh, uh, another favorite one in Oak Park is Carnivore. Mm -hmm. And those guys are those guys are awesome. Right? Like, they make this best uh, uh, 
bacon cheeseburger. And every time I, I'm like, I just can't wait for them to put an order in again so I can buy the bacon <laughs> cheeseburgers. Like, yeah, I need to head out again. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I need to have yeah. something with them. I'm like, oh, yeah. And they're so delicious, but you're like, Okay. It's cool, and now, now you know, it's within a year, year and a half. You know, we're in twenty-five states, twenty-six states, mm-hmm. uh, one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty stores, and and it, I guess the other thing to really go back to is, you know, we're not just doing it to, you know, I, you know, hey, here's this company we're starting it, uh, the Cancer Wellness Center in Northbrook. It's kind of going back to our conversation of. Of the community and, and how people, when, you know, when, when you're sick and people, uh, people kind of come together, like with the birthday party, and the cake, and just like the food, and, and just, you know, it's not just with our own little community. It happens. It happens every community around every city in every state in the country. You know, in probably in the world, right? There's there's those communities, but how do you how do you get back? Like, like it's almost embarrassing in a way, like how people helped us out so much, right? Of, mm-hmm. of, of, of the food, you know, bankers, you know, the, the, and it's like, you, sure, you can say thank you, right? And, and. It just doesn't seem like enough. Yeah, it's like. Because like the kid's memory of his birthday, yeah. right? At the football sure. yeah. field is like, for me, sitting in the hospital, like priceless. Yeah. And all the rides may have not been a big deal or plates, but it took our kid's mind off it and, gave them a great memory instead of thinking like, oh, poor, my, my dad's my dad's in the hospital or my dad's doing this. Yeah, and that word thank you, I mean, it means a lot, but it doesn't travel, you know, like you can't attach enough items to the word thank you and pass it along to really make sure that those people understand what, what how grateful you are. Um, and so, so instead of trying to say thank you to everybody, what we you know what we do is, is put a portion of our net proceeds back to the Cancer Wellness Center and try to pay it forward, which is such a tremendous resource for people that have been affected by cancer, and not just the cancer patient, but the people you know, the caregivers and, okay. and you know, and so 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 instead of saying thank you, it's like, hey, how can we go then and help somebody else out, you know, down the road and, and and so, so it's been just a tremendous resource and just, I mean, I'm, I know from my, like, just so proud to, you know, I know it, we probably don't donate enough to help them keep the lights on. Yeah. But even, it's not even just what you're donating, but even having conversations like this, you know, kind of oh turns gosh. our ear to cancer, um, the wellness center. And then, you know, for our year this year, you know, we're donating every single month to a different organization. And so then that puts that on our radar. But we're kind of inspired though by like people who have done something similar. And it's it's amazing. I mean, their services are free. So when you think about cancer and and you get the bills and yes, we have great insurance. So we're super fortunate on that end to even have that, right? Some people don't, don't. But you think about when he went through 35 sessions of radiation, well, you're paying for parking every day. And what that what that looks like, and it all of a sudden adds up, and and just to have a resource that you're like, our kids need to talk to somebody, and I need to talk to somebody, so I'm not angry at him, and or or I don't have to burden him with the questions that I am asking, and the fact that you have a resource to go that is, I mean, you walk in, you barely fill out a form, they help you out, and the services are never ending, especially for the patients, but it, it was just really breathtaking to realize that there's a resource like that and um, yeah. and we're able to take advantage of it and hope people understand that it's there for the, everybody as well. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, Rosanna and I have talked a lot about um, how it can it can often feel that, you know, you, you kind of get married and you, there's there's a script, you know, you have your career and you raise your kids and then you retire. And, um, uh, you know, a lot of the conversations that spouses may have are like those, like management conversations. Like, all right, I'll take the kids here, and then they have this meeting over at this time. Yeah. And that's part of the like, the mission behind the relentless pursuit. That's why we call that pursuit. Just just the intentionality behind, like having a common vision that's greater than just. I would say the the just us. Than, than, than the script mm-hmm. or the like the, the predictable uh, like kind of common conversation 
um, having real meaning and value behind who you are and who you are as, as a family. Um, so can, if you can speak to that too and just kind of like, you know, the, the nuts are nuts, but they're also like cashews. The cashews <laughs> are more than that. So like what, what, has, what, what has that meant for, for, for you? What kind of you know, vision beyond just you know, offering a tasty snack? Uh, has, has this has this been for you? We just want to provide goodness out there, right? Like, there's so much negativity in the world. Like, you can't turn on the news without having a bad story, you know? Or, you know, it's like there's always like this conflict, or you know, there's always this division of of hey, it's X versus Y, Republican Democrat, you know, blah blah blah. And like, there's nothing that's really bringing people together. And and you know, like being attracted towards those items again, like food, right? Like what 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 is that cohesiveness? As you know, the, the world kind of falls apart. Like and it sounds kind of crazy, like but like that's yeah. I also you know, think that like seems super cool. our kids are our kids are older than yours, so we are like fully in it. Where it's like who's who's where? Where do you need to ride? We our our plans are on hold tonight because. We, we can't have a date night because we have to drive a kid to the city or pick one up from the city. So it becomes, wow, you go from constantly doing the schedule and the running around to them being like, oh, their social life has taken over. Before you could just call in a babysitter, right? And now it's like, <laughs> now it becomes a little more complex that they're older. I think having the nuts um, really presents like, a different conversation, which we also have to put parameters on as well, of, <laughs> of saying, uh, of just like the other night, we were like, all right, let's just have a little strategy session. We had some wine, we sat out on our deck and and started talking about it. And I think that it's, it's almost like planning for the future and having something else in common other than the kids, which is great, but I, I think all we're really faced with, our oldest is going to be a sophomore in high school, we're faced with, it's going very, very fast. Two and a half years. We, we basically have two summers left with him, and it, and it is like, oh my gosh, and then what do we do when they're all gone? And, I mean, to be honest, you really just, like, you want to like each other still, you want to come back to the person that you met. And, right, and say, like, this is why we fell in love, and I, I, I want to see that. And so work, I feel like working together provides that different dynamic, that conversation, and it's not about a schedule. It's not about who's doing what. I mean, we can all talk endlessly <laughs> about, about all of that, but it also becomes mundane, and it's so easy to fall back on. I give you a lot of credit. It. I give you a lot of credit because you've always had that kind of focus outside of that, you know, of of both the family and our relationship. Yeah. I, you we know, call it preparing for retirement. For a one piece, but I said, when our kids are gone, right, and the house is empty, I want to look at you and still, like, I tell them, I, I love you even more now than I did, but, like, 20 years from now, right. I want to be so, like, magically in love so that, like, we grab hands and we get out of play yes. and we go see Greece or we, yes. right, we, we've or built just, a podcast just, or we've done something that we've like, day is still magical. But right. I, I think that gets overlooked. Like, all right, let's put us on hold while we raise kids. And once right. the kids are gone, it's like, well, what, what do we have there? Right, and if you can't wait till that point where it's like, so oh, figure each other out they've again. gone. Which who are where, you now? What? Which right. reminds me of this song. Which, so when we got married, I put the CD together, and one of the songs was, "I love you more today than yesterday." Right. Who, who, I can't remember. Nice. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, but that's sorry. If you want to figure that one out, we'll it over. <laughs> <laughs> so, but um, even we, I mean, we find ourselves like we made a date night. We went out to a restaurant. And we like sitting at the bar rather than a table because we feel like it provides kind of like the kitchen counter, right? You sort of feel like it's casual. There's no like pressure to be like the waiter is coming over to, and now you can talk, right? <laughs> and it becomes, sometimes you're like so in the family stuff that it becomes like. Who am I outside of that? Who are you outside of that? And so we'll often sit at the bar and have dinner and the whole thing, but... Um, I think that maybe some of, I'm not a psychologist, but it sounds like it's so long, right? Like you just want to keep that positivity moving forward. Which the social either, media right? we were just talking about, right? The social media that they both do, right? You know, this might be a good plug for the handles, but... Um, <laughs> and, like, yeah, throw it. 
Uh, so we got Bees Go Me Nuts on Instagram, phenomenal. And the Relentless Pursuit Podcast. Yeah, the Relentless Pursuit Podcast, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's like, and I, that's one thing like, and I, I've been amazed at, right, is is how you've really focused in on that and how good of a job you've done. Nice. But I think it's important. You like keep surprising each other and like looking at each other differently. And I, the, the thing is like, you want to, you're going to grow, you just hope you grow together. together. Yeah, it's like keeping that pot. It's like a snowball, right? right. Like, you know, the snowball is going to go downhill. It's like, are you going to contribute to that snowball being positive or or negative? It's true. Yeah. In the weird. Image like that. So you guys are doing bees for me nuts, but you guys are working full time too. So it's not That's like my next he gets, It's not like he gets to see like who you are and what you do at work. Right. Maybe a little bit more this year if you were home doing it, but like he doesn't get to see like. The, the magic that you make at work. And so then when you do this together, it is. It's a, a different insight as to, you know, who you are and what your skill set is right. and your talents. And so... And for me, yeah. Like, I listen to him on the phone doing... I don't, I don't even listen anymore. <laughs> like, you know, like Charlie, Charlie Brown, right? <laughs> but when he, when he makes a call about the nuts, I mean, I, then I'm, it's like, oh. Like, because... He it's comes, only on the weekends. <laughs> he comes alive right. and you really hear the passion and you know it's they, they say i'm in sales and they're always like oh when you smile you can hear that over the phone and it, he doesn't even tell himself that you can just hear it, hear it. and i mean how many calls do they get a day what are they dealing with throughout their day making decisions and to get a call and it's like who are you and one of the things he's always been really passionate about is like our customer service and checking in and we're more than just a cashier it's really providing the service that, what else can we do for you? Can we provide samples? Do you want me to be there on, a, on an afternoon? We can do that. And how do we help you? And um, and so it's really, for me, been really phenomenal to see that side. I'll sit, I'll sit upstairs in, in an office and like smile, because I think it's really great to see that side of them, and it you know, makes me wow. love you more. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. Um, and again, we just mentioned about the, the social media that and and also your thoughtfulness on looking forward right of, of uh, all right hey there's going to be St. Patrick's Day or you know you know I'm kind of in the, the day to day like all right hey let's keep it moving let's keep it moving and she's able to bring the, the CEO perspective the, the bigger picture perspective and the direct you know, providing that direction which is nice that we compliment each other but then, like, it's not always easy oh, to work together, as you know, because we do work, we have found that we work differently <laughs> together. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's like, now why would you do that? Right. Like, like, That's not how you do it. Right? <laughs> it makes total sense. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then oh, once I explain it, it's like, oh, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Oh. Well, it's, and it's funny because the more we hear, like, more yeah. couples who have, like, opened businesses together or are doing something together, different strengths. But it, it's like marriage, you know? Like, yes, there's going to be big greater, mm-hmm. like, this is not the way that you do it. But it's like, I couldn't run the house or raise the kids by myself. I just couldn't. Right. And neither could he. And so the times that we've tried, we're like, oh, I'm so glad you're back. Because, right, it takes two to do it. Yeah. Um, and so What do you mean there's going to be big <laughs> <laughs> uh, So I, I'm... I'm very curious, just about the the just how you manage the time. Like, how do you manage a you know a very like growing and quickly scaling just, you know business uh, in addition to what you could already occupy a lot of your time with your family and between work. So, you know, especially during COVID, right? It was I think that was one of the nice things of having the downtime. Um, you know, like, you know, when he comes to six, seven o'clock at night, like, hey, you can put on Netflix, you can put on a TV show. And, well, we've and watched them all, so. Right. So, like, oh, there's so nothing else to watch. Yeah. It's like, we've seen Now, there's a podcast long. about TV shows. We'll call it again. But, uh, you know, so we would find that time, right, afterwards. And, like, and so instead of sitting there watching TV shows, like, you know, we spend a couple of hours, like, strategizing. And so, so then that becomes our TV show. And that that time is uh, is, yeah. is really fun. But I don't want to ever just create an environment that like it's not it, it's hard. I yeah. mean, we will absolutely plan to sit down, and then all of a sudden, one of the kids is like, "Can I talk to you?" Mm-hmm. And you're like, 
Well, that absolutely comes first. So you then have to, you know, re-strategize of when you're sitting down and talking about it. Um, I think we've gone through several layers of organization, and Brett's incredibly organized, and he really did start this and sees things in a certain way, and so he wants me to do them in a certain way, and I'm like, that's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what we were talking about. Like, so I had, like, when I started this, I, mean, I had my idea, and it was so hard, and it was so hard to relinquish, right? And I'm like, not that I think you can do a great job, because you can it was like it wasn't necessarily in my mindset like you know so you have this vision and and it's like well that doesn't necessarily align with my vision but then you realize like you're able to open up and like oh my god it, it takes a little bit of time but like wow this vision is even you know as good complements better than you know um that that was that was tough it was almost like trying to get married you know, it was like it's like starting a marriage over you know not starting marriage, but you know, starting dating at a different angle, and, yeah. and I think that's really yeah, that's a lot of like new territory to figure out. Yeah, and a lot of fights too. <laughs> <laughs> and some days we look at schedules. What does your week look like? How busy is it? What's our nights look like? As much as we can plan, and when are we going to sit down? And what's coming up? And what are the ideas you have? And sometimes it's like it would be great to do as we kind of joked about the chalkboard and whiteboard, it would be great to sit there and do that, but frankly, we don't have the time. So we were just talking the other night, like bring your ideas to the meeting and we kind of block it off and the kids know, I mean, they're, it's summer, so they're busy and running around, but it is, it is a challenge to schedule everything. And oh yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. But it's a passion, right. like, exactly. Right. But that's what the passion is, you know, to drive it. And like, you know. Well, I think yeah. part of it is that you can find the time. You can always find the time, and right. you plan, and hope that like the plan it goes according to plan. And when it doesn't, at least it's like you've got these pockets where you're like, okay, well, we know we're going to strategize on Sunday or Monday or whatever that day is. Right. And if something really comes up, then then we'll figure it out. Right. But when it's when you go in and you have no plan and no idea and no strategy. You know, you're not going to get anywhere, but even taking Netflix off the plan, right? Right. And, right. and being more intentional about it kind of changes right. the scope of it. And maybe even changing, like you talked about how we're in COVID, right? It's like, now we can move it outside, right? And it's all of a sudden, it's like our environment's changed. It's actually enjoyable to sit on the deck and, and have a conversation instead of feeling like, especially as we're right balancing so much and it becomes so hard. It's like, sometimes it's just the little things. It doesn't always have to be like, big date night or heading down the city like it used to be when we were younger mm -hmm. and you could get a sitter and and life was less complicated yeah. and now I feel like we were just uh, out of town and and uh, Brett was playing in a golf tournament with my dad and I joked we got to the airport and I said see you someday because it's it's primarily for golf and um, they had two days that were late tea times and I got up and walked every morning, walked to the dog beach and, you know, to the end of the island and then walked back and he said, well, I'll come with you. And it's like, you know, he could have slept in and kind of done his own thing, but it, it meant so much. And it was, it's, it's, I feel like now we've shifted into, instead of the big overnight in the city, it's the little things like doing laundry and being like, I got you. You don't have to worry about this. It's showing her that you care. It's the things that make the most difference. So now I'm chasing, kind of chasing this a little hard. You know, I'm excited, I'm scared, but ultimately, like when I'm doing what I do, I love it. And so yeah. to know that, like, he's a great dad and he's going to take care of things while I'm gone. And it's, you know, one day, 10 or 12 hours at a time. Like, yeah. And the kids do benefit from that going, you know, I always joke, like, I will be upstairs, Brett's standing in the room, and the kids will run up and ask me a question. I'm like, how about your dad? How about your dad? I'm standing there. I'm like, tell them to go see you. Go ask your mother. Go ask the CEO. And so now, it's, so it's great. Like, they can go to him and have that relationship right there, and that's invaluable as well. And know that a man can yes. take care of this yes. or do that or answer these questions yeah. because it's not only him. Right. So I, I, I feel like the kids being able to see you in that role. And I think probably even like seeing me just as the you know the as, the as, as, as the caretaker right as as the dad. Um, but there's this you don't want to say hesitation, but I think for people that are listening, right, you have an idea, but like what's that propellant, right? And fortunately, unfortunately, like 
for us, it was health, right? And I was like, you know, before before we had our health things, we didn't necessarily, you know, we didn't have necessarily have that idea. Maybe we had the idea, but we didn't push through that that barrier, you know, that invisible. That's yeah, and so I guess what was your what was your catalyst? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what was your catalyst to, to jump into this? This is how I would answer it. I think we realized that, like, for a while we felt like life was good and everything was fine, but, like, life is, although short, also long. And so you could do the same thing every day for your entire life and have lived an entire life and really done nothing. So, like, mm-hmm. why not try this and do this for a couple of years? But um, there's, that, there's that projector, though. Like, because I think everything, you know, as I relate, like, and I would, like, if I'm listening, Right, like okay, that's that's great, right? But but what? Like, how do you get that off the couch, right, or off the seat, right? Like, what what is that ejector? Right? You know what I mean? I don't. Well, I think that's a great question because you know one of the things I wanted to ask you is like, what like does does it require a a health scare, you know, or your equivalent trauma to realize like oh we should we should do that thing or do more than what we you know originally planned on. And you know, thankfully, we, we didn't have that. You know, for me, and maybe this is more personal, but it was it was fear of being able to write tomorrow's diary entry today, like already knowing what tomorrow had in store for me, instead of trying trying a new thing. And I would say, like an English teacher, I'm inspired by Thoreau. I've said this podcast. Yeah. Thoreau is a godfather. It's very Walden esque for me myself. Yeah. Um, but like, is is that accessible for a typical couple, or does it require like what is the I like the word like the propellant, right? But yeah. what you know, does it require you know something along those lines to get off the couch and into our, our kids are a lot of our life, and you said like later on like when we're grandparents and we have grandkids, like we want to be able to have like some kind of like longer lasting legacy for them. And so whether it's getting in the real estate market and having rental properties, or we tried flipping a property a couple years ago, it's like well, like here are the numbers, it works out, let's do it. What's what's the worst case scenario? We make nothing and we get some experience and we have a good story to tell later. Right. right? So it's like our can we experience learning, but then how do we then tell our kids about that and show them that it's okay to like take a, a calculated risk yeah. and to see what it is. So it's like, you know, we can tell our kids right from wrong and what to do, but if we've never tried something or done something, like how are we gonna inspire them? To be bigger than they they think they can be, like we're not doing the same thing. That's incredible that you had that foresight to think about that. Because I think it's easy. I think the easy thing is to write yesterday today, right? It's easy to go along, and then you get sometimes you get hit with something. And I think for some people, it's okay. We talk about like, do we want a vacation in the same spot? Do we want to do everything the same year every year? And for us, the answer is no. You get comfortable. Right, and it's easy to, whether it's the kids like the familiarity of, of, of a spot or doing the same thing every year. But we really try, as we used to talk about with our with our kids, like to push them to try something new. It's okay, like I'm a little bit interested in overnight camp. Why can't that apply for us too, right? You don't grow unless you're a little scared. And if you're scared, it probably means you should jump. But I, 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 and I think it's okay to fail too because you have a great story and you're demonstrating for your kids what you're telling them to do. And as they get older, they're kind of looking at you like, well, have you done that? This has been our question that they've sent us and some things you want to admit and some things you don't. You know, I think people are admirable of, hey, oh my gosh, you start a business and, you know, like, oh my gosh, whatever, whatever goes along with that. But, but it's like, and so, so we, we got our motivation, good or bad again, as I said, you know, of, from a health, well, from a health thing. But how do you, how do you take that energy from from being propelled from a from a health thing, but help that you don't necessarily need to have a health thing and inspire people to go do something. And that's where I think it's phenomenal what you guys are doing is you weren't you know you weren't propelled from a health scare. It was it was a want. And then you know I think if we could figure that all out, we could bundle it up and. Be billionaires, right? <laughs> but I think you know because I guess that more goes back to the to the nuts, right? It's like you just want to bring happiness. You want to bring um, 
you know, inspiration. Inspiration, yeah, yeah, exactly. Inspiration where people don't necessarily have to go through something bad to want to go do something good. I don't know. Well, and I like how your story is on your website because I think sometimes people do talk themselves out of it. So whether it's nuns or right um, barbecue, right? People are into barbecuing or wine or whatever it is, like. Everybody's thing is different. Everyone's skill set is different. What brings people joy is different. But it's right. They go to your website because they had your nuts, and then they realize like the story behind it. Right. And maybe that little bit of inspiration propels them to see something in them that they can kind of move forward. And they feel good about. There's tons of research uh, about millennials and people that feel good about giving back to a company that's get, doing good, right? Because they feel like that's their small way of taking part in that goodness. And so I feel like that's why it was important for us to tell our story so that it's not just like, oh, you're you're buying my nuts and this is this is the genesis of where it came from and why and you should feel good about it and then it makes them feel good about it and it solves both of those things. Yeah. And that, that's where it becomes more than just like a like a, a food consumption choice. Right. There's there's a, a discernible like mission and, and value uh, and your your act of you know, like participating in that um, is, is much bigger and, and I think worthwhile in a number of ways than just you know, like making a you know like a, a spontaneous per- purchase based on hunger and taste. Right. And we talked about this with um, when we talked uh, with uh, House of Shan about you know you're you're making uh, sweatshirts. Um, as I think it, it feels good as the, the producer of those things, but also as, as the consumer to say like we're, we're part of a bigger story that's taking place here than just like you know being an immediate need. But I'm gonna say, so what has been the biggest surprise then for you so far in doing the um, in doing this podcast and like taking it from hey having the Mondays to you know here we are sitting now, you know what has been something like oh wow that's awesome or you know, like, oh, I didn't think about that, or, you know, I didn't necessarily have it in me. I'm kind of curious. I have a few surprises. I think just expanding, like, our circles and our spheres of influence and, and who we meet and hearing their stories and letting that inspire us has been huge. Um, and I think the second thing is, too, is just how open and honest we are. We put up these mics. He even records. It goes on YouTube. Like, that's that's not me. Um, I am pretty, I keep things in um, and he hears a lot of them but you know people will like listen to an episode and people who know me and are like I can't believe that you were talking about this or or shared this or like wow and I'm like yep like what you see is what you get you know you it's you, you kind of have to just kind of break past that and be like other people are finding the good in it and so that might mean that I have to just get outside of my comfort zone to do that so that that was the hardest thing for me but it's been surprisingly good that's good yeah um, certainly, the like the the honesty we build into it. So, I mean, one of the weird things is people you don't know know relatively intimate things about you, well, you know, because they <laughs> listen and, and we're sharing these things, right? right? Um, yeah. So that that certainly has caught me off guard a few times as well. But um, I would say that like the, the biggest surprise is the the reception of it, like is the when the goal is actually being accomplished of not just us enjoying. But other people are then thinking about like, oh, this thing that you said, I never thought of before. But now that I heard it, you know, I talked to my significant other, and you know, we're starting to try this or to explore this, and to really, I think that would be the equivalent maybe of uh, like a, like a top ten stores or the like the first yeah. ten stores, you know. Um, so that, that that's really stood out to me as like, wow, this is something we, we kind of do in private and, and you post and you, you you never know what the reception is, but when where's it going out when it is received and it's actually producing you know something that we said like we wanted to accomplish through this, then it's kind of like, well, okay, cool. Yeah, looking at their values, their intentions, their mission, and, yeah. and what their life is about that they've never really asked themselves before. Yeah. So which when you come back down to like that's what. We're here for right, right. So it's kind of neat to just sort of go back to your intention and your roots and where you go from there. Yeah. I'm gonna say, how do you guys determine your topics, right? And like, you know, going about you having, you know, because you have to put on different podcasts. Like, do you guys have to sit down? What What is it that? Yeah. So um, 
we... I'm sorry, I don't mean to turn this back no, on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it's like you're fun to talk about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're always asking other people questions. It's like, you know? Yeah, so a lot of it just comes from conversation. We're, 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 we're always talking, so we're like, hey, I, I heard this thought, so let's talk about this. I'm like, hey, this would make a good show. So you're dialed in. And then, then I'm like, yeah. 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 yeah, and then we just have a list. I'm like, all right, let's add it to the list. And then we'll have, now we, it's really lame. If it's okay if I share what we call, I call it, um, like our very first meeting when we decided to do it. I, I, not her, but I will take the blame for this. Call it exploratory committee. Okay. <laughs> to explore if this was an So now yeah. we're joking that any, anytime we formally sit down to plan the next season, we call it that's the next exploratory committee. Yeah. You see, I'm fine. But it's funny, but we, yeah, there you go, see, I'm fine. We like make the list, and then like halfway through the season, I'll be like, I'll see an option that like, we're not doing it. It's like, why? I'm like, it just it doesn't feel right. And so even learning to like bring things in, like as things are happening in the world, to like leave a space for it, or to feel like let's leave a spot open, and then something something's gonna come up. We're gonna hear about something. We're gonna feel something, and like letting it not always be planned, but kind of right. going off script. So we're in, technically in season four. Um, we have drafted what all thirteen episodes will be, um, but we. I would like to publish those in advance to be like, hey, here's what's coming up. Yeah. Uh, but then, but with them, we're responsive to like, because it's still just a conversation. You can't just fabricate that. Right. So like, what? I want to talk about this in 20 what, minutes. What, what, what do we really feel like is authentic at this moment? Then that becomes the yeah, episode. Right. Um, so whatever we draft in those meetings often morphs into I think something much more meaningful and impactful by the time we actually sit down. Right. And we're not experts, right? Like. Oh, yeah, and, and I think that that's what's almost more meaningful. Like, I love listening to podcasts. I mean, they're great. But there is a difference between hearing an expert and hearing people come on. And even if you're listening to true crime, right, you're <laughs> listening to truly an interview, it's a different experience than listening to a forensic psychologist talk about something. And it's so more meaningful because you relate, because you're that person on the other end. You don't have the degree and the experience of that person. And some people don't have people in their circles that are mm -hmm. open and honest about yeah. whether it's money or sex or kids or health, right? Like that they just, they don't have that. And so if they can find a voice or two voices, right? A man and a woman, because sometimes it's always coming from a woman, a place of vulnerability. Yeah, they're always the same. You know, yeah. like that to have a man's perspective, a husband's perspective, a great father's perspective, like they're, everyone has that opportunity to, to hear that voice. So, you know. Yeah. So, based on your experiences, um, like what if there if, if we were to make a T-shirt <laughs> of your experience or your your advice that another couple could benefit from hearing? Um, first, based on just the, the the caretaking and the experience, uh, you know, of um, your spouse undergoing uh, call the health scare, or health challenge. Um, what would you want couples to hear, based strictly on your your experience and your takeaways from that? Does it have to fit on one t-shirt, or can we? It could be. It could be, it on the back. It could be really small. For <laughs> wow, it's a really big shirt. Go ahead. No, no, ladies, ladies first, please. <laughs> See, that's one of those what? questions that you would ask me, and I'd be like, "You can't just ask me that." Right. Me that's that. yeah. But you know what? I love the spot in it. You know. We can talk about earlier. So, we we touched upon earlier the caregiver, the caretaker, and what would you want to be, and and I think automatically, you like everybody's initial reflex would be, I want to be the person that is the one sick, right? So you you can take that that weight on, right? And and I think. You know, that, that's a simple, admirable, thoughtful, you know, position. But within that, the thing that I never realized is that you, you think about it for your own survival, so you then can be with other people. But as you, as you're fighting that, right, and you're, you're taking that weightness on, you still have to be able to open up and and be that. So, so if I guess it was a it was a T-shirt, I would have a big picture with the thumb out, like the this thumb out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but again, you know, it's just because yeah, man, 
the get it sounds so deep and like it's it's crazy, but it, you know, as you go through life, right? Like what what becomes important and and you know it ebb and flows, but the relationship that you have is you just, you want that other person to always admire you. And even when you're in that fighting moment so they can admire you later, you still want that to be, you know, you still need to be that, you know. I, I don't know. Like, it's it's such a, yeah. yeah it, it, I would say, because yeah. uh, I almost equivalent your question to if you could go back in time and tell your younger self anything. Yes, I right? love that question. I do too, and I'm like, how many, sometimes they're like in three words. I'm like, okay. <laughs> There's way too much. It's a paragraph. Right. Okay. On um, a t-shirt. Okay. So I, but that's the line I'm thinking. And the one thing I would say is it's all going to be okay. Because whether you're the patient or the caregiver, you're going to get through it. And in the end, you're going to be okay. And whatever that looks like, right? It may not be what you started out as, but it's okay because you've got to kind of find your grounding again as a couple after being a patient. And then you have to find your grounding again after being a caretaker. Both are not pretty. And I think that that's, it's okay. And it just gives another dimension to your marriage and the depth of us that you look at one another as you've been in both spots at such a young age instead of thinking of like, I did, like oh, we wouldn't be in this position when we're like 85. And like white and jewel, like that's what that's what I literally right. thought when we took vows, and then to find ourselves in our forties doing this was surprising. And that's what I would say. It's it's okay. It's okay, but I think also you know, to, in fairness to the listeners too, if you know, you always want things to turn out okay. But if it, if let's say for example they did turn out okay, and maybe I pass away or you pass away, right? And that, that sounds really heavy, but people are facing that as well and that's okay too because you know that there's love and that the love between you is there and and so I just want to make sure that there's that connection right. that hey you know we, we were lucky enough to, to be here but there's gonna be other people that aren't as fortunate and um, but that's okay too and mm -hmm. Right, Heart, heartbreak is okay, disappointment right. is okay, right. fear is okay, pain is like it's part of life. Life is okay. You don't, right. you don't know, you don't and know. You get through it, right? It, it is, is the whole point of it, no matter where you are. And I think you bring up a good point about it not turning out the way, but you're still going to go through it and you're going to be okay. The, the, the love is still there, despite everything else. Right. Yeah. yeah, no matter what happens, right? It's like you just put yourself in it. Yeah, I'm not thinking. I'm sorry. You want to try to Yeah. 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 But, yeah, no. You know, we interviewed someone who had lost a child. Mm -hmm. um, um, he had a heart defect and went through multiple surgeries and didn't make it. And even her talking, I mean, it's a traumatic experience. Who's a child and they've gone on to have more um, children. Um, and they're okay. And so it's still hard and it's still difficult, but it's a part of their story and it's a part of their journey. And she said, like, I, that's, that was, that was the hand that was dealt to me, but like, I, I still have a lot of joy. I still have a lot of love. I still have, we still have right. love for him. He's still a part of our family. And so that doesn't go away. Right. Right. Like who you are to the core doesn't go away. What you've built, what's there, doesn't go away. And, and, and it's all about processing and facing it head on, leaning into it and not running away from it. Right. And like, you know, it's scary to face this big, bad monster of, you know, again, and we, you know, we're talking, you know, we're fortunate enough, but if, if death came, right, to your significant other, you've got to be able to to turn and face versus run away. And, and no one, and I guess maybe that's just, that's the story of it, right, is you turn and face it, that's going to be okay, right? You don't have to run away from whatever you're chasing, but just... It also know, reminds me, as, as we've been through all this, of, like, the right thing to say, yeah. right? So you, you're here on the receptive... And of people and and people say things and they, they so they mean so well and you and but they put their foot in their oh they're telling you their story of their aunt and died and or uh, we've heard <laughs> crazy <laughs> stories that you're just sitting there like listen I just put clothes on today and <laughs> came outside for the first time and I'm 
That's really positive. Um, okay, thanks. But you know they mean well. And I guess I go back to the fact of all, all of those first steps, right? We're like coming out with, I remember Brett came out with his feeding tube and I was, I was surprised and really proud of him that he had a feeding tube in and came to our daughter's hockey game. And I watched everybody turn around and stare at him and, and some lady walked right up to him and was like, what's going on? What, 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 what's this about? And I give her a lot of credit instead of like talking about it, just go with the source. And uh, he explained, she said, oh, I'm, I'm praying for you and thanks for telling me. And, and people often don't know the right thing to say and I think it all goes back to like even just telling somebody it's going to be okay. It doesn't mean that like everything's going to turn out right. You don't know that. Right. Right? You can't guarantee that somebody's going to survive this, but you're, you're going to be okay. You're, you're strong enough to get through this and whatever this is. is the answer. Yeah. yeah. So there, I feel like there's so much more to explore in, in some ways for kind of scratching the surface of your experience over the last you know, several years. Um, but if there were um, any uh, anybody who wanted to learn more uh, about you or reach out and contact you, or if you know, wanted to order some of these delicious, of these insatiable, insatiable or that 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 yeah. Um, there's going to be some wine too. No way. No, 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 no. Oh, hey, hey, you got to tell us about it. Right. All right, so <laughs> first, here, here first. Tell, tell us where to go to uh, just learn more or uh, to order, uh, but then I, I have to hear about some wine as well. So, uh, so our website is uh, bsgourmetnuts.com. It's at bs as in bsgourmetnuts.com. And there's a uh, hundred on that website. You'll be able to see the retailer. You can either order directly from us, or you'll be able to identify uh, um, retail locations at a store near you. But this is why. So we've been working on uh, two different flavors. Uh, there's going to be Sublime, which we're really, really close to launching. That's going to be a sweet and salty. It's going to have a nice little touch of, of sweet. Just with uh, cashews, with cashews, yeah, mm -hmm. and then the, but not overpowered. Again, we go back to like yeah. the the we integrity the of the nut, yeah. so that you don't. I mean, we we literally go into every store and try all the competitors, and we're like, this is just our opinion. Like, we just want the strength of the nut to stand, and so anybody can put sugar and maple syrup and whatever else is on the nut, and then you're just tasting those ingredients. Mm -hmm. Our idea is to complement the nut with some flavors that you're like, oh, that's really interesting as I taste it. Yeah, a, a depth and texture that mm -hmm. you don't find in your standard, which you can hear on our website. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then the other one that we've been getting a lot of, uh, I'm gonna say pressure because that's not the right word, but um, excitement for people that are really gravitating, want to gravitate towards is uh, spicy. And so that's actually gonna be called uh, fire, F-I-E-R-Y. And so it's gonna have. We're, we're still working on it. We don't. We don't want to just launch out and, and say, "Hey, here, you know, here it is." We're really, you know, it's it's that's been a difficult one to perfect because there's there's a, you know, there's spicy and then there's tasty spicy, and and so what what's that balance? And we haven't found that that exact balance yet. But, um, Hopefully, our holiday uh, challenges. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Put it on the chalkboard. We had, we had, right, right. That's always our thing. We had a really great holiday season last year. A lot of people bought them as gifts, corporate gifts. Um, we sent them to people who bought them for their dad, and um, we paired with somebody who we had cups made, saying like "Merry and Bright" and fun sayings, and um, did that as a package. And we paired with um, Cocktail Courier as well. Um, you know, they prepare the cocktails and our nuts were, yeah, as, as a side, which is great because it, obviously you feel like having a cocktail as you, as you eat them. Um, so our holiday season is always our biggest, so the goal. Right. I tell you what, I just got to say this before we cut off. This has been tremendous. Like I've had, I've had a really yeah. wonderful time and, you know, I, I was really nervous initially, to, you know, you know, I was like, yeah, you got the speakers and, you yeah. know, but. You guys made us feel so comfortable, and it makes me, I don't want to talk for you, but um, I'd, I'd be, I was so comfortable, and it was, it was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys inviting us to do this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
think it's, it's a lot of fun for us as well, especially because I think yeah, once you hit record, it's a lot, it can be a little awkward, um, and also just just kind of meeting, you know. <laughs> Uh, right. it's, and uh, I was, you know, we were talking earlier. It's like, you know, what what a great opportunity just to have, you know, relative strangers kind of come over and have a pretty intimate conversation. I mean, right. what a great excuse to be able to do this. With and how often does that really happen in life? Right? Like, right. we we we'll go out to dinner, right? We'll sit at the table, and you guys would be sitting right next to us, having your own conversation, and we're like. <laughs> Leave us alone. Yeah, you know, but that's going to be our next game at the next session. We're like, they have a nut business. They right. have a podcast. They make, you know, they, they yeah. make and sell things online. Yeah. That's what we're going to name as everyone's secret oh, yeah. superpower. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but even if you do talk to the people next to you, you certainly don't get as intimate as we did today. Yeah. Because yeah. it is just a quick conversation. So we appreciate yeah. it. And so thank you so much for opening your kitchen and your home up to us. And very thoughtful. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. And um, like I said, there's, I feel like, a lot to learn from this conversation and uh, a lot more that I feel like we can you know, tap into as well. So we look forward to, I hope... Uh, Netflix uh, TV will hey, <laughs> that's, that's the next one. We'll compare and uh, contrast. Our, we'll rate our, our favorite, uh, what we should call them, like our, our pandemic Netflix binges. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much for listening to our conversation that we shared with Brett and Christine Bowman. Uh, if you want to learn more, or even if you want to order any of the insatiable or decadent nuts that Rosanna and I had a chance to indulge in, uh, we strongly encourage that you do so. Go to bsgourmetnuts.com, and there you can place an order, find a location that sells Bees Gourmet Nuts nearby you, and learn more about Brett and Christine themselves. You know, and just a reminder from the episode, we don't need to wait for a health crisis or a trauma to take a chance, a risk, or to explore and follow a dream. That's right. And it was a really great conversation to just uh, explore uh, that topic and to be inspired to continue to take life off of autopilot and do as much as we can to make the most of it together. And what Christine and Brett have really found is that this this journey of the Bees Gourmet Nuts has led them to connect with others who face similar challenges, and it's not just about selling a product. Absolutely. So we thank you so much for listening to us this week, and we're looking forward to sharing more throughout this summer season as well. Thanks so much for tuning in today, everybody. Have Bye-bye. a great day.